Everyone, if you happen to be here, please uh, say hello. And in the chat, let me know where you're um, where you're located. I've got my iPad here. Uh, I just thought I would just do this impromptu um, live Zoom, live um, <laughs> live YouTube. I haven't done this in a while. I'm really rusty. So uh, I apologize, but if any of you happen to be there, I'd love to hear from you. And I'm testing out some new equipment. And um, so hello there from Sweden. Awesome, you guys. Lynn and Janet and Laura. Wow, that's awesome. It's really great to see you. <laughs> There's a lag between when you guys say hello and, uh, and then my being able to see you on the chat. So um I wanted to say hello. It's been a while and just wanted to let you know I'm still alive. I uh, hope that you guys are all doing well. And uh, it's been a crazy year, as you all know. And uh, even doing a live video, it's, it's, it's been kind of far from my mind because of X, Y, and Z that has needed to be done. And um, I'm sure you all feel that way. It's a, it's a time where we all feel really discombobulated and um, it's been a very interesting year, to say the least. So anyways, um, I did manage to get into my studio. I've been painting a lot, though. And uh, this is one that I, um, I have documented the entire thing. Um, I think I'm going to call it Hanging by a Thread. And what I wanted to really talk about, in addition to answering any questions that you might have um, after I talk about this painting, is that uh, I know one of the big questions that artists have is all about content. And the other question is about, well, you know, especially the way I work, you see that I put a ton of paint on there. And then in the end, I cover up so much of it. So the question is, well, why did you do that? I mean, paint is expensive. So why do you put it on there if you're only going to cover it up? So content and covering up paint, those two things I kind of want to address in this uh, YouTube live and I also want to tell you that um, if you did not get a notification that I just went live, there's a reason for it. Um, it means you're not subscribed to my channel. And I'm hoping to do more live videos because I've got new equipment that I've been experimenting with. And I feel like um, I want to stay connected to all of you. I mean, it's been so hard with this pandemic because we can't see people. So the way to subscribe to my channel and get a notification when I go live, and it's the only way to get a notification, is to subscribe to my channel. So you hit subscribe, and then when you do that, you see a little notification bell. And if you click that bell, that means that um, YouTube will notify you. I won't. They will. And then you won't miss a live, because I don't know how long I'll be doing this, you know, this particular session. But I want to answer questions. Um, I definitely want to like just um, be of any help and encouragement and inspiration to anybody who wants to tune in. So the only way to do that is if you're subscribed. Otherwise, because I, I will just be very impromptu with this. I don't always plan these lives. I just want to like when I want to go, I want to go. I don't always say, hey, in two weeks, join me live. It's not my life doesn't work that way. <laughs> Everything is uh, pretty much spur of the moment. I like to just uh, go live when I feel like it. So anyways. Um, two things then, um, and by, by the way, this entire painting, which is now done and it's got borders because it's canvas, it's going to be stretched later, but it is not stretched now. So therefore the borders look messy and I'll explain why they're messy. But um, the first question that I get a lot of is, well, um, you know, you, you started with so much paint. Um, why did you cover up so much of it? And and this entire painting is documented. It's going to be in my Watch, Learn, Grow library, but it's not there yet because uh, how many hours of video? Five, six, seven, eight. I don't know. It's a lot. And um, it, like it's way too long for YouTube. So it's going to go in my library. So if you haven't checked that out, um, there's a link in my description where you can, you know, tune into that. I've got over 80 hours of video in there. So if, if you're like, I'm tired of Netflix, I'm tired of Amazon Prime, I want something to watch. Um, if you want to watch tons of my painting, that's what's in the library and a lot of other things too. So um, that's where this content's going to be. Like I, I, this painting is done. All the documentation is coming to the library. So um, I, I kept a limited palette. I mean, you can, this is kind of what you see here is, is essentially what's on my, table um 
I had red, I had yellow, I had yellow orange, um, black and white. So I kept a palette fairly simple. Um, a lot of people that I work with in the master class and um, I've been sort of letting people know that I've been binging on Project Runway. Um, I have to admit, I used to do a lot of sewing. My mother was a pattern maker. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm so tired. Like I just want to tune into something and, and be a zombie, you know. But what I found with Project Runway, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, there are many, 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 many seasons. I could tell you all the ones I've been watching. What I love about it, though, is that it's fashion, um, and it's, it's under pressure, like, you know, there are these limitations where designers have to work under time constraints, money constraints, materials constraints, but they're, they're competing for these prizes. But what happens is um, they have critics, you know, judges who judge the work. And what I love to listen to is that critique. You know, I do critiques in my master class and I've been learning some new critique skills. So, and also I learn about, like, I apply what I see in the world of fashion to my own work. So fashion is a form of art. And I found this little niche of a program where I uh, just wanna share that with you if you wanna binge on Project Runway, it's pretty awesome. Anyways, so with all that, the reason I'm telling you this is because I've been watching so many seasons and uh, we have a granddaughter now and it's been like, okay, well maybe I should start sewing again. Um, I started to get uh, replace the things I lost in the fire, like my sewing machine and my thread. And, you know, one thing led to another. I need elastic and I need bias tape. And it's, oh my gosh. Anyway, so with all that in my head, um, this underpainting has a lot of references to pattern making. So if you've never done any sewing, um, uh, that you may not understand what I'm talking about. But um, I talk about how... Um, <laughs> I kind of made some pattern pieces, like this would be a sleeve that I cut out out of crystal paper, and that's like right here. So in the in the series of videos, you're gonna you know I'm gonna show you how it is that I came up with these shapes that are meaningful to me. So there is content in the painting, and there are many many layers of like content that you're building and building and building. It's like historical, so. The first question being, well, yes, there's a lot of paint underneath these white shapes. Um, lots of like mark making. And I actually had some pattern pieces that I did with a thick black acrylic marker. This is actually acrylic marker. Um, it's hard to see a lot of it now, but I had references, you know, to pattern pieces and I made my own. So there's that content. And then I don't know, the color was, um, it was kind of bright, but the color to me, it's more about value. So I was watching my value and then of course it got very chaotic. And um, so when I started to cover up the underpainting with these big blocks of like more simple white and high key areas, um, I just wanted to say that the content is underneath. And then because I made my own kind of shapes, I bring some content into the final painting as well. So, you know, I couldn't get these little areas that I left open if I hadn't started with chaos. And, and I, I feel like chaos is sort of like reflective of my life. And then when I put these pieces on top, like these, these bigger shapes, it's kind of like, do you, do you see how this has made the painting a lot more calm than some of my other work? That's a decision that I make each time I paint. Um, these were my tools. I had acrylic paints. I wasn't sure whether I was going to go into cold wax and oil. I don't, I'm not going to in this case, because this is another first for me, is working on canvas. And this was uh, pre-gessoed and I taped the portion all along here. That's going to be, if it goes stretched, you know, if it's stretched, then I'm going to lose this. I needed to have an extra border. So you want to keep at least like probably three and a half inches if you're going to stretch it later. So that was another first for me. And um, at that point, does anyone have any questions? Um, I'll stick around if any of you have questions. I know this is really impromptu, so um, I'm not really prepared to talk about much else. Um, just want to answer any questions that you might have. So chat is the way to ask me something if you have a question about this painting or anything else in my studio. Um, 
Okay, so Laura, you're asking, um, yeah, how to proceed. Are you asking about this painting or some other painting? Because this one's almost done. Um, I pretty much feel like it's done. Are you, I'm not sure if you want to, okay, this one. Well, how to, from here, I would have to, I know that it's three feet by six feet and I've left a border here. So the, what I would have to do, there one of two ways I could actually get this to the end stage, which would be stretching it. I could either stretch it over, stretch your bars, or I could adhere it to a cradle panel that is exactly three feet by six feet. So I did measure this very carefully. I had to make sure that everything was square, you know, not wonky and like oblique. Uh, so that if my stretcher bar or my cradle panel is exactly three feet by six feet, then I staple these, um, these edges over and then I'm gonna have to finish these since I got drippy paint dripped both behind the masking tape, which was masking these edges and it kind of caught the edge. That's why it looks the way it does. It didn't stay pristine, but that's okay. So I would just paint over that. Um, um, hello to Lynn Buckingham in Australia. And okay, the color code dots um, is a V. I'm not quite sure if you mean these dots, like um, what I did there was I I also uh, explain in my videos, in my library, how I do use digital media sometimes to mostly toward the end of a painting. Like what are those, like I check balance. And um, one thing I did, if I can find it here, here it is. So I went into Photoshop. I sometimes use digital media to um, like this, in this case, you know, I stapled to the wall. So for me to flip it around and, and see how well balanced it is, that would be nearly impossible. So I take a photo I throw it into Photoshop and then I can rotate it. I can go back. I can rotate it 90 degrees, another 90 degrees. I can flip it horizontally and vertically to keep checking that balance. And then um, this is a little print that I did um, of the um, Photoshop version. Uh, made a feel like one thing that I did when after I worked in Photoshop was I, I had like this, there's a lot of color here. I decided to knock it out with this shape because I felt like it was too much. And what I find happens like in a painting like this, you know, at first you feel kind of like badly because you're covering up so much of the painting. Like you're, you, you have all that color and it's pretty and kind of nice, really spontaneous. But then you realize the more you cover up, the more you want to cover up. So that whole idea of less is more gets easier and easier. And yeah, sometimes you go too far and maybe you cover up too much. But for me, um, what happens is, um, like, as I started to put these, these white shapes on here, I started to feel like, oh, my gosh, there's so much red. And the more I covered it up, I felt like um, my sensitivity to the amount of red got stronger and stronger and stronger. Like, the difference between way before I put these shapes on and then after is like, well, in the beginning, I thought it was maybe okay. But then after I covered it up, it was like, oh, whoa, it's like way too much color. So again, I feel like in the end stages of your painting, you want to improve on your sensitivity to everything that's happening. Um, the amount of X, Y, and Z, the amount of texture, color, shape, size, direction, you know, like what's going on and what do you really want to say? So what I really try to do with this painting is capitalize on content. There's actually so much content in here. Um, yeah, so that was a great question. Um, what else is there here? Judith, how do you demonstrate on Zoom Live? Okay, great question. In fact, I did a Zoom. I, I tested out um, an answer to your question. Um, essentially, a Zoom Live class would be just like this. And I can show you how. Um, I've got some new equipment here. So I'm going to try and show you how even though my table is an absolute disaster, right? I can actually tilt my camera. Um, I can also bring things in closer. So if I'm, let's say that this uh, iPad here is my palette. Um, I can actually zoom in on that. And, and then, you know, I can zoom out again and I can actually convert what we're looking at. Like if I wanted to show you um, this painting here in black and white, I could actually do that. So, um, 
That's one of the things that I've been working on, I guess, during the pandemic is how do I make, if I'm going to do a Zoom workshop, I want it to be as close to me being there as possible. Um, because I have some scheduled now for, you know, Houston and Calgary, um, and then these other ones through the Facebook group, I want to try to make sure that they're the best experience possible. So what I hope to do is have them be kind of project based, like we're going to do this, we're going to work on two paintings, here's the parameters, we're going to do a complementary painting, we're going to do a black and white painting, or we're going to do this. And then for the intermediate group, what I hope to do is... I got kind of excited when I thought of this. I have um, collected so many challenges from uh, all the live uh, calls we've done in the Watch and Grow Library and also just from within my uh, master class that I'd like to po like present a challenge and then have all of us work on it at the same time, whether that's large scale, small scale, working in a series, um, working with a limited palette, I've got so many ideas that and things that I want to do. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, why don't you do it with me? And then, you know, we can check in with each other and I can comment on paintings. I can, um, you know, you guys can actually unmute yourselves on a Zoom call and actually ask me questions like during a break. So that's kind of the idea of a Zoom class. OK, is there anything else? Is that a truth that you can mix any color with gray? To get neutrals um well that depends because if i take say a lot of a bright color like this like okay let's say gotta use like some measurements here um i say two tablespoons of this and one drop of gray um yes i have essentially manipulated this color and it is a tiny tiny bit grayer but if i don't add enough of this to actually desaturate the red so it's noticeable then I wouldn't call it a gray until visually I can see that it's not as saturated anymore. That's true of any one of these colors. I could take red, I could take green, I could take blue, I could take yellow. I mean, if you drop um, one drop in a swimming pool, you're not going to know what you did, right? But if you if you have enough, it's, it's all about proportion too. You start to manipulate a color by adding more and more and more of another color. And it's at that point when you start to visually see that, oh my gosh, it's not yellow anymore. It's now like a yellow gray. Um, but if you think about the color wheel, and this is our basic color wheel that I talk about a lot. Um, essentially, here's our neutral gray in the middle. And we all know that if we mix yellow and violet or blue and orange, we don't really get a gray. We get kind of a greenish gray. But the point is that um, this kind of tells you that it is by mixing that we desaturate any of these bright colors. Um, by combining them, you're going toward a gray. So there's an explanation for why, um, whether you're mixing a gray with a color or you're mixing colors that are far away from each other on a color wheel, that they tend to go toward a gray because that's what our color, color wheel shows us. And that is true. So um, that's another great question. Okay, what else do we have? Um, yeah, varnishing um, kind of depends on the medium, Laura. So if I'm working in cold wax and oil, my final varnish after the paint is completely dry is just a final thin layer of cold wax medium, let it dry, it's done. Whereas in this case, this is uh, this is acrylic and it stayed acrylic. It did not move into cold wax and oil. Um, I don't really think it needs a final varnish. I think a final varnish does have this um, cohesive, in addition to the, the practical thing where it's, it's just a good thing to seal everything in. Um, it's gonna have like, it, it'll create a, some sense of harmony, even if it's colorless, I believe, because it's going to make the surface quality all the same. Just subscribe so that when I go live, you can ask your question. And um, thank you all for being here. Um, it was really fun. And I just wanted to try this out. So now that I have gone live, um, I feel like I can do it again. There's a lot of technology involved. I hope you could all hear me. Um, and if you enjoyed it, then just um, thank you for saying hello. And I hope that you're going to stay well and be safe. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. I guess I'll see you later. Bye now.